Switch hitting is one of my favorite things about baseball because when you break it down, it's honestly so bizarre. Hitting a baseball is already one of the most difficult things in all of sports, but hitting from both sides of the plate is just insane to me. Can't even rack my brain around how anyone could be able to do this. You have to be able to comfortably swing your body and arms properly from each orientation with a leg kick or toe hold that is also using a different leg from each side, and your dominant eye will have a different perspective. It's not just one little thing, there's multiple mechanics to switch hitting that make it so unbelievably difficult. So with all that in mind, is all this work for a simple platoon advantage all really worth it? It's already difficult enough to be struggling at the plate, but imagine what it's like to struggle from two different sides of the plate at different times, which requires varying changes, micro adjustments, and tweaks to your mechanics. And that's exactly what we'll be diving into today. How advantageous is switch hitting? Which players have thought about leaving it behind? Who has actually given up on it? And who in the league could potentially benefit from giving up on switch hitting in the future? So, I'm going to start off with a little section about switch hitting in general and the unique advantage it brings to a pitcher-hitter matchup. Obviously, a big part of switch hitting is just feel. One of the biggest reasons why hitting against a pitcher of the opposite handedness is considered an advantage is just being able to see the ball more easily, as well as the advantage against pitch types. Let's say a left-handed pitcher is facing a right-handed batter. Breaking pitches such as sliders become much more difficult to execute for a lefty pitcher. In this kind of situation, a pitcher might have their arsenal narrowed down as they might want to avoid pitches that break right into the barrel of someone's swing path. If this was a righty-righty matchup, a slider is typically much more effective as it breaks away from the hitter. There's a lot more intricate stuff involved, but the stats back this up as well. In the history of baseball, this is how left-handed pitchers have matched up against each side of the plate. Pretty clear gap here. As for right-handed pitchers, we have a smaller gap, but it's still clear that there is a matchup advantage. Also, if you're wondering why that is, it's likely because the lefty-lefty matchup is by far the least common in all of baseball. So it can be difficult to master that matchup when you have far less experience against it in real games. Now that we've established the advantages of switch hitting, let's dive into a case where it didn't work out so well. For this section, I'm going to talk about a player that I mentioned very briefly in my Cattell video. If you've ever heard anything about former switch hitters in recent years, Cedric Mullins is probably the one you've heard the most about. Not just because he's a former switch hitter, and that's kind of rare to see happen in the big leagues, but because of the immediate success story as a result of it. Mullins' early parts of his career were pretty rough. There's not really any other way for me to put it. He was drafted in the 13th round, so I don't know how high expectations really were, but the highest ranking I found for him was when he was the 7th highest prospect in the Orioles farm system in 2018, which was a farm system ranked pretty low at the time. This Fangraphs ranking from the end of 2018 had the Orioles as one of the lowest ranked farms in the league. Now Mullins didn't have crazy minor league stats or anything, but across both AA and AAA in 2018, he slashed 289, 346, 472, for an 818 OPS. It was his highest OPS in any of his minor league years, which is really interesting considering usually double and triple A are where guys struggle to adapt the most. Mullins was called up in August of that year and in 45 games, the stats weren't great. He ended up with an 86 OPS plus over 170 at bats. A quick rundown on OPS plus, it normalizes OPS across the league and takes into account situational factors like different ballparks. 100 is league average, and so anything above or below that is either above or below league average. But 186 OPS Plus is 14% worse than the league average hitter. That's not very good, of course, but it was his first stint in the majors, and even guys like Trout and Judge struggled in their first glimpses of the bigs. However, 2019 is where things got pretty rough. Mullins started off the year slashing .094, 181, 156 for an OPS of 337 and an OPS plus of negative 9. He was sent down to the minors and didn't come back up that year. He had ended up 109% worse than the league average hitter. But this is a small sample size, so how much of this could have been negatively impacted by luck? Honestly, Everything that could go wrong was going wrong. Mullins' BABIP, or batting average on balls in play, was a measly 118. In case you don't know, the reason people like to use BABIP as a quick indicator of luck is because it's something that can be heavily affected by small sample sizes. It's going to vary by skill, but 300 is usually considered league average, and BABIPs that are heavily above or below that number are likely getting lucky or unlucky. But like I said, it depends on the player. Some of the best hitters in the league are going to be above that 300 mark. In baseball, things usually even out over the course of a full season, but 22 games can be the difference between everything going your way 
and everything going horribly wrong. So Mullins was likely getting unlucky, but on top of that bad luck, he was just flat out not hitting well. And the only thing in his metrics that was above average was his K rate. Everything else was incredibly low. So even beyond the luck, there needed to be a lot of changes. In 2020, Mullins thankfully didn't uncover an even rockier bottom, and he had the best hitting season of his career so far, albeit each year he's played has been quite short. But the one big thing that came from this year, and from his previous years as well, was how apparent it was that his right-handed swing was becoming a serious issue. When it comes to any batter, you're likely going to have a matchup where you hit worse. Usually, it's against a pitcher of the same handedness, so like righty on righty or lefty on lefty, but sometimes it's not. As a hitter, you want to be in the best situation you could feasibly be in, but you don't have that choice. Switch hitters are obviously switching sides to do just that, gain an advantage in every at-bat. However, Mullins' splits so far don't justify this decision. In his first three years from the left side, so against right-handed pitching, Mullins slashed 250, 305, 394 for a 699 OPS. Now that's not spectacular or anything, but his 147, 250, 189 slash line with a 439 OPS against left-handed pitching was very much not helping. Stats with that big of a difference and that low basically makes switch hitting not really worth it anymore. From then on, things changed really quickly. Mullins gave up on switch hitting going into the 2021 season, and he and the Orioles decided it would be best for him to just hit lefty full time as it was his natural side. Not only did Mullins approve his stats against lefties, he just straight up improved all around too. So much so that Mullins ended up making the All-Star game, placed 9th in MVP voting, and slash 291, 360, 518 for a 878 OPS, a 137 OPS plus, and he had a 30-30 season. The turnaround was absolutely insane and completely unprecedented. He went from barely getting playing time to being top 15 in the league in F4. It's easy to attribute the success to giving up on switch hitting, but I honestly can't adequately describe the success of this year because the next two seasons, Mullins wasn't really hitting like this again. Maybe pitchers started to figure out how to attack him on the left side, but all around his splits dropped off quite a bit in the last two years. Regardless of the fact that Mullins has not been a yearly six war player, he's still been far more productive in 2022 and 2023 than he ever was when he was a switch hitter. He's had extremely good center field defense alongside hitting that is just about league average. It may not be top 15 in the league, but it's still well above replacement level, and I doubt he regrets becoming a full-time lefty. So who else has tried to give up on switch hitting? And did it work for them before Mullins did it in 2021? I think another one of the most significant examples recently is Shane Victorino, who had an interesting relationship with switch hitting towards the end of his career. For his first nine seasons, Victorino was a solid switch hitting bat all around. He had a 102 OPS plus in all those years, so just about league average. But in 2013, Victorino was forced to stop hitting lefty as he was struggling with multiple injuries at the same time. Then in 2014, his injury problems were still there and he only played 30 games that year. In those 30 games, he did not hit lefty a single time, only facing right-handed pitchers from his right side. But prior to the 2015 season, Victorino wanted to make his return to the lefty batter's box, until Red Sox manager John Farrell announced about a month later that that would not be the case. As far as I could tell in his last season, he mostly hit right-handed all year long, albeit in not that many games. Injury seems to be the biggest story here with Victorino, with it not only having adverse effects on his longevity towards the end of his career, but on his switch hitting as well. This makes it a unique case in comparison to someone like Mullins, who mostly needed to give up switch hitting because he wasn't very productive. Speaking of, how productive was Victorino when hitting exclusively ready? Well, in his entire career as a right-handed hitter facing left-handed pitching, that's where he was at his best. He slashed 299, 369, 491, for an OPS of 859 in that matchup. On the other side of the plate against righties, Victorino slashed 265, 328, 398 for an OPS of 725 in that matchup. So he was considerably better from his right side. But what did the switch to full-time right-handed hitting look like? Well, he had surprisingly similar stats to when he was a lefty. In 539 plate appearances, Victorino slashed 266, 322, 394 for an OPS of 716. Obviously, there are far fewer plate appearances here, and there are two different stretches of his career, but it's interesting to see that being a full-time righty wasn't too bad of a transition, at least stats-wise. Really quickly, 
I have a bit of a caveat here because something in these stats just kept bugging me. The big issue I have is baseball references saying that all his splits from 2013 were as a full-time righty. But when I researched this further and watched the archived game footage, you could see this isn't true. He didn't stop switch hitting until sometime in August of 2013. I don't feasibly think I could check every plate appearance for Victorino to correct these stats, mainly because I don't have that luxury of time, but I could tell you for a fact that these stats are wrong, and I can't in good conscience pretend like they aren't. I'm not blaming Baseball Reference or anything. I love this website, and it was likely a small mistake, but it looks like they just combined all his plate appearances against righties, whether he was a switch hitter or not, instead of splitting them up. So based on the stats Fangraphs has, which unless they're wrong too, but it looks correct to me, he didn't have an OPS of 716 as a righty versus right-handed pitchers, he had an OPS of 706. After all that, it's a difference of 10 points, but I wanted to make sure the information was really correct here, and let you know in the highly unlikely scenario that you ever decided to go on Shane Victorino's baseball reference page and were wondering why the stats in my video were off, this is why. So, in this case, I would say Victorino benefited from giving up on switch hitting. Despite his desire to return to lefty hitting in his last year, it was probably a lot easier for him to physically give it up. Stats can help us understand if something went well or if a decision was ultimately worth it. But in this scenario, even if his hitting became worse, it seems like it was for the best for him to just leave switch hitting behind. Next up, I thought I'd bring up Cattell Marte's situation, even though I go much more in depth with his switch hitting woes in my other video. Cattell's had a very back and forth career so far with switch hitting, and prior to the 2023 season, he experimented with becoming a righty full time. During the Dominican Winter League, Cattell tried to hit righty against right handed pitching, and it did not work out well for him whatsoever. He said that he thinks it's just too late for him to try and give up on switch hitting. It's too ingrained in his head, and seeing breaking pitches go away from him, likely for the first time in several years, was the hardest part about it, he said. He didn't have that many at-bats as a full-time righty, but he knew quickly that it wasn't viable for him. However, Marte is not the only one who has experimented with hitting exclusively righty for a short period of time. In 2014, Aaron Hicks was really struggling at the plate especially from his left side. In his first two seasons, which adds up to 150 games played, Hicks slashed 201, 293, 313 for an OPS of 606. Really not what you want to see, but let's look at his platoon splits to see how the matchups were affecting this. As a right-handed hitter, Hicks slashed 244, 349, 409 for an OPS of 758. So right off the bat, we can tell just from this that the left-handed splits are really holding him back but let's see what they are exactly. As a lefty, Hicks slashed 185, 270, 277 for an OPS of 547. As you can see, Hicks was really struggling from his left side. It's also even worse because righties are far more common to face, meaning he had 384 plate appearances on his worst side versus just 149 plate appearances on his better side. This was getting to Hicks mentally as well. According to this MLB.com article, Hicks said, now it's only one side I have to worry about, and it's the side I feel confident on. I've been thinking about this for a while, but it was just a decision I felt like making. It's been a combination of a lot of things. For me, I just want to produce and help this team win, and think this is the decision that's going to do that. However, this decision didn't last very long, as Hicks only really gave up switch hitting for about a month. As far as I know, he's never tried to give up on it ever again. The real question is, did he ever figure it out? Well, from 2015 to the present day, as a righty, Hicks has slashed 254, 332, 426, with an OPS of 758. As for the left side, he slashed 231, 342, 387, for an OPS of 729. So for a large part of his career since then, he has had very equal platoon stats. Since 2021 though, it's a bit of a different story and he started to struggle from his left side again. But that's kind of what switch hitting is and always has been and overall I'd say it's been worthwhile for Hicks to keep doing it, even if the earliest and most recent years have been subpar. Well, who's next? Giving up on switch hitting is not easy, both physically and mentally, as we saw with Victorino and Hicks. So it makes sense that it's not really a common occurrence. Just because you're struggling on one side doesn't really mean you'll be any more successful on the other. Not to mention, it's pretty difficult to test things in baseball. You really can't spend many regular season at-bats experimenting with things. So if something's not working fast, a player will likely leave it behind. But I want to see who might benefit from at least experimenting with becoming a full-time righty or lefty. I'm not saying any of this is concrete, because trust me, I know this is easier said than done, 
but there are many switch hitters out there with very disproportionate stats. Will they end up like Mullins and elevate their game, or will they end up like Hicks and figure it out? We won't know unless they try, so let's take a look. Starting off with Patrick Bailey. In Bailey's first year with the San Francisco Giants, he's been producing super efficiently behind the plate. He's already solidified himself as one of the best framers in the league, and he missed over 60 games. However, the one thing that's not super efficient has been his hitting. In 2023, he slashed 233, 285, 359, for an OPS of 644. That results in an OPS plus of 77, pretty well below the league average and even a bit low for a catcher. So now let's take a look at his platoon splits. As shown earlier with Hicks, struggling as a lefty is a brutal punishment because you have more than twice as many at-bats from that side compared to your better side. Therefore, Bailey's 49 OPS plus as a lefty is dragging down his quite good 118 OPS plus as a righty. But you know what's funny? This was almost the exact opposite in the minor leagues. In 83 minor league games in 2022, Bailey slashed 252, 370, 481, with an OPS of 851. Meanwhile, as a righty, he slashed 133, 243, 217, for an OPS of 460. If that doesn't tell you how cruel this sport is, I don't know what else to tell you. Imagine finally bringing your ready swing up to par, just for the lefty swing to be the one to fall apart next. Not to mention, that has to be so mentally taxing to deal with. Although, I'm pretty confident Bailey can figure out his lefty swing again, and when he does, he's going to be a serious threat at the plate. This is Bailey's first season, so I don't think giving up on switch hitting is the move right now, especially given the fact that he has shown to be proficient on both sides, just unfortunately not at the same time. But if he can't figure out his lefty swing in the next few years, it's something to consider down the road. The next player is yet again another guy who just debuted in 2023, but Ellie De La Cruz is in a similar situation as well. De La Cruz took the league by storm when he first arrived, but as the season went on, he really cooled down and his platoon splits are a big reason for that. In his limited time in the majors, De La Cruz slashed 235, 300, 410 for an OPS of 710. However, against righties as a left-handed hitter, De La Cruz slashed 256, 328, 471 with an OPS of 799. This is not bad at all, especially for your first year, but as a righty, De La Cruz slashed 184, 231, 263 for an OPS of 495. That's not great to see, and it's obviously why his overall stats are being brought down a lot. Now, is this consistent with De La Cruz's minor league stats? Kind of. In De La Cruz's time in the minors in 2022 and 2023, he was much better on his left side than on his right, which is in line with how he's done so far in the majors. However, De La Cruz is naturally a righty, so that should be his more comfortable side, and it was for his first few years in the minors. He was better as a righty and worse as a lefty, but flipped that over time. My assumption here with both Bailey and De La Cruz is likely something that happens with a lot of switch hitters. They spend a few years really struggling on one side and hitting exceptionally well on the other. So they naturally try to tweak and change the side they're struggling with, giving it the most of their attention. They're not abandoning practice on the other side, but there's likely a large amount of focus on the side that isn't performing well. Once they figure out their worst side, their better side wasn't getting as much attention, and they lose that swing. I don't think that this is at the fault of the player. Being a switch hitter is really hard if that wasn't obvious already. Overall, I'm saying the same thing I said for Bailey. This is a bit too early in his career to consider giving up on it as an option right now. But if there's not much improvement, each year this becomes a more and more relevant discussion. If we're in 2025 and De La Cruz is still struggling from his right side, how much more of his career can he really spend trying to fix? Fix it. Next up, we've got a guy who's been in the league a bit longer than Bailey and De La Cruz, and that's Ozzy Albies. Albies is easily one of the best second basemen in the league, and he just had one of his best individual seasons yet. But as a lefty so far in his career, Albies has slashed 249, 311, 444 for an OPS of 754. I don't think this is bad at all, but his righty stats are ridiculously good. As a righty, Albies has slashed 338, 365, 571 for an OPS of 936. Both of these get even better when looking at just 2023, with his righty stats being completely ridiculous. I know it's platoon advantage and a smaller sample and everything, but he's hitting just shy of 400 as a righty. I will say though, those lefty stats are not bad at all, but relative to his righty stats, it looks like he'd benefit from giving it up. But I want to reiterate what I've said throughout the video, and that giving up on switch hitting is significantly easier said than done. 
son. Not to mention, Albies has talked about it himself. When the prospect of becoming a full-time righty was brought up by a few reporters in May of this year, he didn't really seem like it was too much of a concern for him. He said he's had a conversation about it with coaches before, but he just loves switch hitting. And to me, that's all that really matters. If Albies likes switch hitting, who am I to say he should give it up? I think it would be cool to see if he elevates his production as a full-time righty, but there are a lot of variables involved here, and there's the chance it causes more harm than good. You can't really spend a season testing something when you need to win games. I could see it being something that is brought up again if his left side gets worse, but he doesn't seem to be too concerned about it. I don't really think there's a concrete answer to the question, should this player give up on switch hitting? I don't want to sound like all I'm saying is, oh, this guy could benefit from giving up, but what do I know? But that's just kind of how it is. There's way too much involved with the process of being a switch hitter for me to just look at a guy's splits and tell you he should stop doing it. Not to mention, players don't really want to give up on something that easily. They're usually very determined to figure it out, and that's something that is prevalent among MLB players as a whole, whether they switch hit or not. I do still like to speculate speculate though, which is why I brought up some players that could do it. I think a lot of these guys could and probably have been having a discussion with their coaches on whether switch hitting is still the future for them. I'm also curious, who else do you all think could benefit from leaving switch hitting behind? I saw a lot of solid candidates and wasn't really able to get to all of them in this video, so let me know. In my opinion, I think there's a good reason we don't see very many people go down the path Mullins did. It's really difficult to change what you're familiar with, and above all else, these guys usually really like being switch hitters. Thanks for watching.